Methvin. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, JavaScript performance in the browser's world. And you really do live in the browser's world, so you have to think about that when you try to make your JavaScript perform. Just first, a little bit about jQuery. Uh, it's the most popular browser library by far. You can see we're taking over the world here. We've got 68% of the top 10,000 sites and more than half of the top 1 million sites. And we're not just uh, the caretakers of the jQuery code. We also participate in the standards process to represent the developers of the world. And we support those web developers through training, education, and documentation. One of the things I sometimes hear is people say, JavaScript, jQuery, the browser, it's not a good development environment. You know, I, I wrote my code in Perl and Python and C Sharp, and it was a lot better over there on the server. Things, things worked a lot better than it does in the client. Um, a poor workman blames his tools. There's actually some really good tools out there today. We're not in the land of IE6 anymore. Um, there's, there's a lot of good tools that you can take advantage of to make your code work really well. You need to change your mindset, though, because if you're a uh, server developer, if you're used to a situation where you have your code and you're calling a runtime, for example, you're calling the C runtime, you know, browser's just like printf. I just tell it to put some stuff on the screen and it does. But that's not really the case. Um, the browser is actually a very complex set of functionality. There's a lot of stuff that the browser can do all by itself. It doesn't need any help from JavaScript. And in fact, JavaScript is so non-essential to this process that it's optional. You can actually write a very functional web page without a line of JavaScript being there. So how do I make my code fast? Well, there's a lot of things you can measure to see whether your code is fast enough. Um, there's only a subset of that that you actually should be measuring. There's a lot of uh, red herrings, a lot of things that will send you off the wrong track. Uh, let me give you one example of that, loop optimization. Every programmer loves to debate whether pre-increment or post-decrement or counting up from zero or down from the maximum amount is the best way to do a loop. Um, it, it turns out that, yeah, a simple for loop does do the job, but even if you pick the worst possible way to loop, according to this benchmark, it only takes 140 microseconds to do 10 iterations of a loop. And in a browser, you generally don't loop over something 10,000 times. It's actually very unusual to be processing 10,000 of something in a browser. So it also turns out that those JSPerf style benchmarks, if you've written something for JSPerf, uh, you can easily be deceived because the new JavaScript engines, such as V8, are very smart about what they do. So you can write a benchmark that makes you think something is true and it's not. There was a great video that I recommend that you go out and look at on performance and benchmarking showing how the V8 engine in particular can optimize away a lot of the things people try to measure in a JF just per benchmark, including things like what's the best way to do a loop. So usually your application is not bottlenecked on loop ever overhead. If that's the worst of your problems, you probably need to work on a something like caching where you don't have to go through the loop 10,000 times. But there's a larger quote. You, you've probably heard premature optimization is the root of all evil. This is actually the entire paragraph that that was taken from. And I want to draw your attention to the green and red parts. We should forget about the small efficiencies, say about 97% of the time, things like loop optimization. Um, premature optimization is the root of all evil. But we shouldn't pass up those opportunities in the critical 3%. So 97% of the time, this should be you. You should be very sad that you don't have to be clever. You just write really good, easy to understand, easy to read code, and it's fast enough. Then we come to the 3%. What do we do to make sure that that 3% is fast enough? that it looks smooth, that animations work smoothly, that there's no stuttering in our web pages. Fortunately, it turns out on the client side that often those problems can be solved by what I would call a peephole optimization. You simply profile your code, you look at where it's taking up its time, you rewrite that small amount of code or you figure out a way you can cache the information, and you don't need to make massive architectural changes. So 
that also means that you can do those things near the end of your process. So as much as I would love people to follow best practices, it turns out that a lot of the time that I spend is people who have followed worst practices and you're just trying to fix the worst of their practices. So in summary, we're all bad at guessing where our programs are spending their time and tools can help us find those bottlenecks. What kind of tools? Webpagetest.org is one example. It gives you, uh, it actually is just, you go to webpagetest, you enter your URL in, and it analyzes it. It tells you if there's some things that you can do better as far as delivering content, whether you can optimize the way images are, are delivered. Um, you also, if you're a web developer, you should know what this is. That's a waterfall diagram. It's very important to understand the way resources are delivered to the browser and make sure they're delivered as efficiently as possible. And there are also tools like Google PageSpeed, which will tell you both in a mobile and a desktop environment important things to do. I think the irony here is uh, the number one should fix here is that there is render blocking JavaScript and CSS. In this page, that's an ad. So you find that very commonly, that the most common performance slowdowns on people's pages are ads and external content. And there is also a browser add-in called YSlow. But all of those things are, are very much about optimizing the entire web page. And we're here to talk about JavaScript. So I want to talk about how the tools inside the browser can help you determine what you're doing in JavaScript that's making a page slow. Some of the things, uh, I'll cover uh, Chrome and Internet Explorer 11 in particular. I'm not as familiar right now with the uh, Firefox tools because they've just on, over, uh, undergone an overhaul. And uh, they all offer about the same set of functionality, error consoles, debuggers, profilers. If you're familiar with the um, Firebug tool uh, add-in to Firefox, it does many of these same things as well, including a waterfall diagram, which is very, again, very useful for determining if your resources are being blocked for no good reason. So let's look first at a very simple case. This is something that JavaScript programmers can do when they think about the browser as their runtime library and don't realize that asking it what seems like a simple question can turn out to be a very expensive thing. Force layouts are when you make a change to the document that potentially affects the dimensions of some elements on the page. So that might be changing the class of an element. It might be explicitly changing the width or height of an element. Um, and when you do that, the browser, if you, at some point, will need to reflow or relay out the page to make it look the way you ask it to look. So if you made a box bigger, it needs to push everything out of the way or widen the page. And that's usually fine. That happens when the browser finds a good opportunity to do so. Generally, the browser refreshes the page every 16 milliseconds or so. But you can make it much worse by immediately asking the browser, about those new dimensions. You can say, well, add a class, and then uh, exactly how did that change the page? Did it make things wider? Did it make them smaller? Unfortunately, there's really only one thread, the UI thread, that handles both of those things. And this blocks other work being done, and it causes, uh, essentially causes the browser to lock up while that calculation is being done. So here's a really simple force layer, layout example. I have a, a div with a class box, another div, uh, with a class container. It turns out that some browsers are very smart about if you, a if you were to change box and then ask the width of box, it realizes that there's no cascading that went on and it's very smart and won't cause a relay out. But uh, if you ask for the container's width, which I've done here, um, I've created a force layout. I actually, in my script, in this case with jQuery, asked the width of the container the browser then needs to say, okay, it looks like you've just added a class to this element. I better go and recalculate all the styles and figure out the widths to make sure I give you the right number. Now, this actually, although it's a very trivial example, and you may say, why would someone do that? It turns out that in large programs, this kind of thing can go on all the time. So, um, we're a little short on time. I'm going to skip an actual demo of this and I'm going to move on to um, just showing you what actually happens when you run the
the browser tools to determine force layouts. Chrome makes it really easy for you. You see the little yellow triangles. That's telling you that in, during that operation, there was a forced layout. And you can open that up and look, hover over it, and it will tell you where the forced layout occurred. Now, in this case, the code used jQuery to, d to create that forced layout. So it appears that jQuery forced the layout. And it did, but only because you ask it to, so don't blame us. Um, but this is a very, a very obvious you know, yellow triangle. When you see that in, in Chrome, it gives you an idea that you may be doing something wrong. In IE 11, with their tools, there's a UI responsiveness tool. You run that. It's similar to Chrome's timeline tool. And if you see an offset width followed immediately by a layout, that means that you have forced layout. Now, you notice right below it, there's another offset width without a layout below it. That's because, well, you already forced it to calculate the page, so the second one is almost free. And I say almost. So to avoid forced layout, what can you do? First of all, you want to get JavaScript out of the path as much as possible. As much as I'm sure you all love writing JavaScript, you only want to write script when it's the best way to do something. And it turns out for things like animations, jQuery used to be your, your go-to tool for, for animations. Today, you can do most of that with CSS, the tra CSS transitions and animations. Now, you don't get quite as much control, but in return, you let the browser make a decision about the best time to actually do those calculations. If you do need to force layout, you can use request animation frame, make all your changes at once, every frame 16 milliseconds roughly, and do your layout forcing measurements then rather than forcing layout several times during the same frame. But that was a toy example. Let's look at a real example and see how hard it can really get. Uh, Gimmick Book, which is the site I'm looking at here, it stutters during an infinite scroll. Uh, it seems to get worse as the page grows, and it uh, happens to be using something called the jQuery Masonry plugin. So in Chrome, you can see here it's actually, as I scroll, the scroll bar is getting smaller because of the infinite scroll. And it's taking a while. This is actually in real time. It's getting slower and slower. Um, by the way, I, I was going to do a live demo here, and then I started using the Wi-Fi, and I decided it would be better to do a video for you, just so that we wouldn't have any uh, real long pauses. So to determine what's going wrong here, uh, I'm going back to Gimmick Book, and I'm going to open up Chrome's Dev Tools, and I'm going to start the timeline view, and I'm going to scroll again, and we'll see several long yellow bars, which are the activity that goes on while the infinite scroll is happening. So it, it appears, strangely enough, we're, we're waiting for some resources. We're definitely having to download some stuff. But it seems like there's something going on here that's very CPU intensive, um, which is somewhat odd. You wouldn't expect, if all I'm doing is adding some stuff to the bottom of the page, that it, shouldn't be, that it should be that CPU intensive. Uh, but again, we all know that we are bad at guessing. If I was guessing to begin with, I would have said, well, we're waiting for the network. That slow Wi-Fi is hurting us. But that didn't turn out to be what it was. So if we look through, um, we can actually see, looking for these large bars, you can see there's several long bars here. And they also have uh, force layouts, which you might think, OK, so maybe it's that force layout problem again. But if you actually look, drill into those force layouts, it turns out that they're really not that taking that much of the time that is going on here. Uh, when we open that up, you'll see the little yellow, the, the bright yellow exclamation point is actually very short there. So what actually is going on here? Um, we're a little short on time, so I'm going to actually go on to the next slide, and I'm going to show it to you in Internet Explorer 11, so you get to see two sets of tools. Uh, if Internet Explorer 11 has a UI response in this view, it is very similar. You see we ha we've scrolled down three times. There are three bursts of activity. Red in this case means um, uh, CPU activity. So I'm going to zoom in on one of those scrolling events. And again, we see, uh, we, we see no frames being drawn. You see the little visual throughput. There's no frames being drawn for almost a second. 
while CPU and garbage collection goes on, which is not good at all. Um, if you look, uh, come on, come on, future Dave, scroll down. There we go. Uh, if you look, you will see there we have the large bars again, easy to find. It takes a half a second to do that. So what's happening? A lot of style calculations, but it doesn't appear that we're forcing layout that much. So it maybe isn't, again, very, uh, very clear what is, uh, we're getting styles, our one offset width does force a layout, but it only takes 1.76 milliseconds. Hey, that's pretty fast. So forced layouts are not our problem here, despite, you know, both Chrome and Internet Explorer are showing that there are some there. So we, we need to drill in a little more. What we can do, though, is let's look at the, um, the profiler, which will actually show us what instructions are being executed by, uh, in JavaScript, rather than using the timeline view. And if future Dave will just, there we go. Um, so we're going to switch to the profiler view. We're going to start a profiler run. I like the way the guy listens to me. And as we scroll down, we'll see some more scroll events occur. I'll stop the profiler. And we look in, th it's really interesting here. There's offset width way down, but there's also this function apply in math max, and there's 89,000 calls to math max. What is going on there? That's crazy. Um, well, it turns out that if you go to the, uh, Mike did this, which is the, uh, the plugin that's being used, it's using a very, very inefficient JavaScript algorithm. This was actually not really meant for a, um, an infinite scroll page. So this masonry layout, when it's called, it actually recalculates the layout of the entire page rather than just the piece that gets added to the bottom. As a result, this math max is called thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Um, so we can actually put a breakpoint on that and cause a scroll event run again, and you can see the value of f, which is our loop variable, is 935 times. So that's, as we're scrolling through, it's, it's having to actually do this thousands of times. So uh, what have we really learned from this then? There's um, obviously a lot of problems if, if you're not careful with algorithms that as much as we would like to say, obviously you have to be careful and understand the browser, that first of all, I, I'm very bad at guessing ben, uh, bottlenecks in code. I've guessed at least two things and I was wrong before I actually profiled and found the problem. Thank goodness I had browser tools that showed me the way. Uh, building block development has its limits. The, the masonry plugin that was being used here is a very good plugin. It really wasn't designed for a situation where you wanted to recalculate the page over and over and over again with an infinite number of elements. It can undoubtedly be fixed for that, but it's something that as a developer you need to understand that you can't necessarily treat everything you drop into your page as a, dra as a black box. You're a JavaScript developer. That's why you're here. You're at .js. So you should be able to, to reverse engineer when, when needed other people's code to understand why it's slow and making your page slow. And the final thing, which I think is actually very heartening and probably would be heartening uh, as well for that quote about premature optimization, that Donald Knuth was right. Algorithms do matter, and they matter even in JavaScript, and there are times such as this when a slow algorithm makes your page slow, and it's not something simple like taking a while on your network connection. So uh, thank you very much.